I was raised to believe that the Bible defines good and evil for us within its pages. But when we stop and examine this idea using the Bible, we discover something else. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. A tree that would bring life to all who ate of its fruit, and a tree that brought death. And it was the second tree, the tree that resulted in death, that contained the knowledge of good and evil. Have we been deceived by the serpent who is trying to get us to eat of the second tree? Is the Bible really trying to define good and evil for us? Let's take a step back. Let's run an experiment. Instead of seeking to define good and evil, let's instead ask the question of the trees. Let's attempt to define life and death, but to do so, we must first seek it out. So join us as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Hey everybody, welcome to the Deresh Chai Experiment, the show where we take scripture seriously, which often leaves us with a healthy fear of God. We are nearing the end of the book of Deuteronomy, and here near the end of the Torah, the text gets down to the proverbial brass tacks. As we've tracked through this book of Deuteronomy, we have seen the various parts of the Suzerain Vassal Treaty in action in the text. We have already seen the following parts of this treaty already. Number one, the preamble, Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 5. Two, the historical prologue, Deuteronomy 1, 6 through 4, 49. Three, Stipulations, Laws, and Regulations, Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 25, 19. The handling of tribute from the vassal to the suzerain. That was the last chapter, Deuteronomy 26. Four sections out of the eight sections that belong to this form of treaty. Well, this week we encountered the fifth section of this treaty. Curses for violating the covenant stipulations and blessings for obedience to them. And this will be the primary focus of this book for the next two weeks. When you conform yourself to the terms of this treaty, things will go well with you. If you do not, then there will be consequences. And if we think about it, our own form of law in the West conforms to these expectations. Do what the law says, and in theory at least, you will not run afoul of those whose job it is to enforce the law. You will be blessed with peace and safety from the lawmakers and enforcers, even if you don't get such things from your neighbors. But if you transgress the law of the land, then there are penalties that you can expect to be enacted against you. Penalties that can result in various undesirable outcomes, including death. And every government throughout the history of the world operates in this way. Do right and good as defined by our society and be rewarded with peace and safety. Do wrong and evil as we define it, and you will be punished. And yet, when people turn to these chapters of Deuteronomy and the corresponding chapters of Leviticus 26, they get shocked. Not perhaps at the idea that God might punish us for rebellion, more so at the severity of the punishments that are prescribed here in the text. Make no mistake about it, these punishments are truly terrible for anyone who has to live through the times that these chapters describe. The downward spiral of curse upon curse that is described as the resulting punishment for turning away from Hashem goes quite low. It goes to a place that many of us would describe as hell on earth. The worst possible conditions that a person could find themselves living through. And often when we read through these chapters, this is where we fixate. The curses that are the outcome of rebellion. But these chapters, they contain something else. They contain blessings. Why don't we focus on the blessings when we read this? They're much nicer as they describe a life that is, well, blessed. All sorts of good things as the reward for submission to the will of God. So why do we often focus on the curse? Well, I think it's because the conditions of the curse is where humanity has found itself repeatedly throughout history. We identify with the curse because this is what our world looks like when we examine it. And why is that? Is it because this is the primary force operating in history? No, it's because history focuses on times of upheaval and destruction and change. History rarely focuses on times of peace and prosperity. 
pick up a history book, and try to find the times of peace and prosperity. They're very few and far between. And it's in these times of upheaval and change throughout history that look the most like what are described in these chapters. And if this is the case, that at a minimum, in every few generations, a part of humanity experiences curse-like conditions, then what does that say about our world and its condition before Hashem? Regardless of this, these blessings and curses describe the entire gamut of human experience, the ultimate expression of experienced good and the ultimate expression of experienced evil. So let's read these chapters, and as we do, let's keep an eye out for these extremes as they are spoken of in the text. Deuteronomy 27 and 28 And Moshe with the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Guard all the commands which I am commanding you today. And it shall be on the day when you pass over the Jordan to the land which Hashem your God is giving you, that you shall set up for yourself large stones and plaster them with plaster, and write on them all the words of this Torah when you have passed over, so that you go into the land which Hashem your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as Hashem God of your fathers has spoken to you. And it shall be when you have passed over the Jordan that on Mount Ebal that you set up these stones which I command you today, and you shall plaster them with plaster, and build an altar to Hashem your God there, an altar of stones. Do not use an iron tool on them. Build the altar of Hashem your God with complete stones, and you shall offer ascending offerings on it to Hashem your God. And there you shall sacrifice peace offerings, and eat there, and rejoice before Hashem your God. And you shall write all the words of this Torah on the stones plainly and well. And Moshe and the priests and the Levites spoke to all Israel, saying, Be silent and hear, O Israel, this day you have become the people of Hashem your God, and you shall obey the voice of Hashem your God and do his commands and his laws which I command you today. And Moshe commanded the people on that day, saying, These are to stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you have passed over the Jordan, Shimon and Levi and Yehuda and Yissachar and Yosef and Binyamin. And these are to stand on Mount Eval to curse. Reuven and Gad and Asher and Zebulun and Dan and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel, Cursed is the man who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to Hashem, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed is he who makes light of his father or his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who moves his neighbor's boundary. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who misleads the blind in the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who twists the justice of the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his father's wife, because he has uncovered his father's bed, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with any beast, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who strikes his neighbor secretly, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who takes a bribe to strike an innocent being, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who does not establish the words of this Torah, and all the people shall say, Amen. And it shall be, if you diligently obey the voice of Hashem your God, to guard to do all his commands, which I command you today, that Hashem your God shall set you high above all nations of the earth, and all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, if you obey the voice of Hashem your God. Blessed are you in the city, and blessed are you in the field. Blessed is the fruit of your body, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your livestock, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed is your basket in your kneading bowl. Blessed are you when you come in, and blessed are you when you go out. Hashem causes your enemies who rise against you to be smitten before your face. They come out against you one way, and flee before you seven ways. Hashem commands the blessing on you in your storehouses, and in all to which you set your hand, and shall bless you in the land which Hashem your God is giving you. Hashem does establish you as a holy people to himself, as he has sworn to do if you guard the commands of Hashem your God and walk in his ways. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that the name of Hashem is called upon you, and they shall be afraid of you. 
and Hashem shall make you to have plenty of what is good in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground, in the land which Hashem swore to your fathers to give you. Hashem opens you to his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain on your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you do not borrow. And Hashem shall make you the head, and not the tail. And you shall be only on top, and not be beneath, if you obey the commands of Hashem your God, which I command you today to guard and to do. And do not turn away from any of the words which I am commanding you today, right or left, to go after other mighty ones to serve them. And it shall be that if you do not obey the voice of Hashem your God to guard to do all his commands and his laws which I command you today, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed are you in the city, and cursed are you in the field. Cursed is your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed is the fruit of your body and the fruit of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed are you when you come in, and cursed are you when you go out. HaShem sends on you the curse, the confusion, and the rebuke in all that you set your hand to do, until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly, because of the evil of your doings by which you have forsaken me. HaShem makes the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. HaShem strikes you with wasting disease and with inflammation, and with burning and with extreme heat, and with the sword and with the blight and with mildew, and they shall pursue you until you perish. And your heavens, which are over your heads, shall be bronze, and the earth, which is under you, iron. HaShem makes the rain of your land powder and dust. From the heavens it comes down on you until you are destroyed. HaShem causes you to be defeated before your enemies. You go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall become a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the heaven and the beasts of the earth, with no one to frighten them away. HaShem shall strike you with the boils of Mitzrayim, with tumors, with the scab, and with the itch, from which you are unable to be healed. HaShem shall strike you with madness and blindness and bewilderment of heart, and you shall be groping at noon, as a blind man gropes in darkness and not prosper in your ways, and you shall be only oppressed and plundered all the days with no one to save you. You become engaged to a wife, but another man does lie with her. You build a house, but you do not dwell in it. You plant a vineyard, but do not use its fruit. Your ox is slaughtered before your eyes, but you do not eat of it. Your donkey is violently taken from before you, and it is not given back to you. Your sheep are given to your enemies with no one to save them. Your sons and your daughters are given to another people, and your eyes look and fail for them all day long, and your hand powerless. And people whom you have not known eat the fruit of your land and all your labors and you shall be only oppressed and crushed all the days. And you shall be maddened because of the sight which your eyes see. Hashem strikes you in the knees and on the legs with evil boils of which you are unable to be healed, and from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. Hashem brings on you and the king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. Thus you shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a mockery among all the peoples which Hashem drives you. You take much seed out into the field, but gather little in, for the locust consumes it. You plant vineyards and shall labor, but you neither drink of the wine nor gather, for the worm eats it. You have olive trees in your border and do not anoint with oil, for your olives drop off. You bring forth sons and daughters, but they are not with you, for they go into captivity. Locusts possess all the trees and the fruit of your ground. The sojourner who is among you rises higher and higher above you, but you come down lower and lower. He lends to you, but you do not lend to him. He is the head, and you are the tail. And all these curses shall come upon you, and they shall pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you do not obey the voice of Hashem your God to guard his commands and his laws which he commanded you. And they shall be upon you for a sign and for a wonder, and on your seed forever, because you did not serve Hashem your God with joy and gladness of heart for all the plenty. And you shall serve your enemies whom Hashem sends against you, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in need of all. And he shall put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Hashem shall bring a nation against you from afar, from the ends of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a fierce-looking nation, which shall show no regard for the elderly, nor show favor to the young. 
and they shall eat the fruit of your livestock and the fruit of your land until you are destroyed. And they shall leave you no grain, nor new wine, nor oil, nor the increase of your cattle, or the offspring of your flock until they have destroyed you. And they shall besiege you in all your gates till your high and fenced walls, in which you are trusting, come down in all your land. And they shall besiege you in all your gates and all your land which Hashem your Elohim has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom Hashem your God has given you in the siege and distress in which your enemies distress you. The man among you who is tender and who is very delicate, his eye is evil against his brother, against the wife of his bosom, and against the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, against giving any of them flesh of his children that he eats, because it is all that has been left to him in the siege and distress with which your enemy distresses you in all your gates. The tender and the delicate woman among you who has not tried to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and tenderness, her eye is evil against the husband of her bosom and against her son and against her daughter and against her seed which comes out from between her feet, and her children whom she bears, for she eats them in secret for lack of all, in the siege and distress with which your enemy distresses you in all your gates. If you do not guard to do all the words of this Torah that are written in this book, to fear the honored and awesome name, Hashem your God, then Hashem shall bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and lasting plagues, and grievous and lasting sickness. And it shall bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this Torah, Hashem does bring upon you until you are destroyed, and you shall be left with few men. Although you had become as numerous as the stars of the heavens, because you did not obey the voice of Hashem your God, and it shall be that has Hashem rejoiced over you to do you good and increase you, so Hashem does rejoice over you to destroy you and lay you waste, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. And Hashem shall scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And among those nations you are to find no rest, nor have a resting place for the sole of your foot. But there Hashem shall give you a trembling heart, and failing eyes, and sorrow of being. And your life shall be hanging in suspense before you, and you shall fear night and day, and not be certain of your life. In the morning you say, Oh, that it were evening, and at evening you say, Oh, that it were morning, because of the fear of your heart with which you fear, and because of the sight with which your eyes see. And Hashem shall bring you back to Egypt in ships, by way of which I said to you, you are never to see it again, and there you shall be sold to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one to buy. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of Hashem is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. When we consider the qualities of Hashem, one of the most spoken of in many circles is the quality of judgment. And not just judgment, but the natural state of humans to fall on the guilty side of that judgment. And in modern Christianity, in many circles, falling on the guilty side of judgment has only one side effect. Hell. The eternal torment after death. There's little that occurs in this world that happens as a result of judgment from God in this viewpoint. And this is the view that I grew up with. Bad things, well, they just happen. Terrible occurrences in the world. Bad weather, plagues, wars, etc. Well, these aren't specifically from God. They're simply the side effect of living in a fallen world. Their existence and such occurrences, uh, this, they're purely chance. You see, in the modern church, the curses of the Torah no longer apply. These curses are just as outdated as the Torah itself. There is no curse of God that is to be found in the physical world. The only curse that remains in this age is the curse of hell. And they'll point to a single verse to make this case. Galatians 3.13 Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, having become a curse for us. For it has been written, Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. You see, there is no more curse of the Torah. We have been redeemed from such things. And since these terrible events, they always happen to catch up some few Christians at a minimum. Well, then it's obviously not one of the curses of the Torah, because Christians are immune but you know what hasn't passed away in this view? The following verse, Galatians 3.14. In order that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the nations in Messiah Yeshua to receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
the blessings of the law, well, these have not passed away. The things that the Torah describes as blessings, they sound an awful lot like new creation. No more death or crying or defeat. Simply bounty and blessing for all. And so the terrible things that occur in this world, these are not curses that are intended to get us to examine our lives and to turn towards repentance. Nah, it's just another terrible random tragedy in the world. No need to slow down and examine yourself. The only curse that you need to fear is the curse that comes after you're dead. But if this is the case, then what are we to make of the book of Revelation? What are we supposed to see in its pages? Because it's angels from heaven that pour out the judgment on the earth, not on the dead, but on the earth, on the living. You see, the last time that we went through these curses back in Leviticus, we focused on the fulfillment of these curses that we found in the book of Ezekiel. Near word-for-word repeats of the curses of Leviticus being experienced by the people of Judah and Jerusalem during the Babylonian conquest. And yet, even in this, the people recognized their failures, they repented, and they were allowed to return to the land to establish the kingdom of Judah. But then it happened again. From 70 to 135 CE, the curses described here were visited upon the people of Judah and Jerusalem. The terrible plagues and famines that accompanied a great war and eventual exile of the people from the land. These curses being poured out on the Jews after the death of Yeshua. The thought of many Christians to this set of events is that the people of Judah and Jerusalem continued to live under the Torah, and with the death of Yeshua, the Torah itself became a curse. Galatians 3.10, For as many are the works of the Torah, are under the curse, for it has been written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all that has been written in the book of the Torah to do them. You see, they say the works of the Torah have become a curse to Israel. The standard has changed. Before Yeshua, it was obedience to the Torah that became the grounds for salvation. But once Yeshua came, the Torah itself became a curse. And suddenly what had been the way of living and blessing became the means of death. Now, frankly, there are so many problems with this way of thinking that I don't have the time today to address them all. But what I can do is I can demonstrate that the curses of the Torah are still applicable in our world. It is these curses that will be the foundation by which Hashem judges, has judged, and will judge the earth and its inhabitants, according to the book of Revelation. I can also demonstrate that the standard by which the curses of Revelation are applied to the world is the standard that's laid out by the Torah, and that the standard for escape from the wrath of God poured out in Revelation is a life lived according to the Torah, and the testimony of Yeshua, and that the standard for persecution by the beast is likewise according to the same standard of the Torah, but again, not just the Torah, the Torah combined with salvation through the Messiah Yeshua. Now that might seem like a pretty outlandish claim, but I am so confident that I can make the case for this that we're going to take a break for a bit and we're going to turn to the pages of Deuteronomy and we're going to examine the blessings and curses as described here in order to lay some groundwork before then turning forward in scripture before we close to make this case. So when we turn to chapter 27 of Deuteronomy, the text might seem a bit familiar. We've read this before, not just the blessings and the curses in the book of Leviticus, but this call to erect stones at Mount Eval and at Mount Gerizim, these two hills that overlook the city of Shechem, and to then inscribe the words of this Torah on those stones. We read of this back in chapter 11, just before the nitty-gritty of the legal portions kicked in. You see, as we went through these chapters, we recognized that all of chapters 6 through 25 are part of the 10 words, but chapters 6 through 11 weren't really law. They were instead a foundation that the law was based on. They told a gospel message. The kingdom of God is here, and you can be part of it. It is a kingdom that is entered in through a declaration of allegiance and is based on a gift of grace that is not earned. And this kingdom requires righteousness, but this righteousness cannot be achieved through human action. And it is based completely and fully on the motivation of love. And this is vitally important as the rest of what followed in this book is based fully on that foundation. 
Without this foundation, a person is just spinning their wheels and pursuing air, even if they keep the Torah exactingly. And so as we lead up to the rest of the legal portions, which actually contain what we would consider the commands and laws, we read of this event that is to happen on Mount Eval and Mount Gerizim. But this time we get a bit more information on just how this event is to be accomplished than we did earlier in the book. When Israel gets there, the tribes are to be split into two. On Mount Gerizim, the mountain of blessing, were to go Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. On Mount Eval, the mountain of cursing, was Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. So why were the tribes split this way? Well, when we consider it, all of the tribes on the mountain of blessing were children of Leah and Rachel directly. These sons would have been seen as the more honorable than the sons of the handmaids. But this isn't the whole story. You see, Reuben and Zebulun were also sons of Leah, but they are on the mountain of cursing. Why is this? Well, first off, because Reuben was the firstborn, but he was placed under a curse by Jacob, and so it's fitting that he stand on the mountain of cursing. And Zebulun? Well, Zebulun did nothing wrong. Uh, Instead, he is the youngest son of Leah, and so he too was placed on the mountain of cursing as the natural son with the lowest amount of honor. This was accomplished so that there could be an even distribution of six and six on the two mountains. Now make no mistake, however, that these positions, they said nothing about who would receive blessing and curse, or who was blessed and who was cursed. Rather, they were a visual picture that was created based on the standing of honor and shame that would have been known by all. Blessings, they are a place of honor. And curses, they are a place of shame. So the tribes with the highest honor, they go on Mount Gerizim, and the tribes with the lowest honor, they go on Mount Ebal. It's simple, and it's effective. No shame was assigned at this event, rather the cultural convention of the ranking of honor in the family was being followed. Now this would be seen as no different than the places that each would have taken at a table when they gathered around. A convention that we see used several places in Yeshua's parables, speaking of places of honor around the table, and that we saw back in Genesis when Joseph sits the brothers around the table. And so it is from here that a series of twelve curses are declared over the people, with the people to echo their agreement to the terms of this curse with their own mouths. Cursed is anyone who participates in idolatry. Cursed is anyone who disgraces his parents. Cursed is anyone who takes of the inheritance of his neighbor. Cursed is anyone who leads the blind astray. Uh, This is a spiritual principle as well as a literal principle. Cursed is anyone who twists justice for the vulnerable classes. After this, the next four curses all have to do with sexual immorality. Cursed is the man who sleeps with his father's wife, with a beast, with a sibling, or with his mother-in-law. Then the tenth is cursed is the man who strikes another in secret, an ambush of sorts. 11. Cursed is the man who strikes the innocent. And 12. Cursed is anyone who does not establish the words of the Torah. The word used for established here has the potential meanings also of to stand or to rise, but also a meaning of to endure or to maintain. These being the 12 curses that the people actively agree to be the things that will cause a person to be cursed. And nearly all of these things are things that occur in secret. Then in chapter 28, the text transitions to the blessings. And in the first two verses, I want to point out the occurrence of the word Shema twice. And this is one of those places that I want to highlight that the word hearken, to hear and to consider deeply, works much better than what my translation does with these words by simply translating them as simply obey. Because this is not calling for simple rote obedience and box checking as many conceptualize the Torah. It's calling for an entire change in perspective and attitude to conform to the ideals of love, compassion, mercy, loyalty, righteousness, truth, and justice. And the laws that are described, they are an outpouring of these things. And the items contained in this list, they are things that everyone wants. Blessed are you no matter where you live, city, country, doesn't matter, blessing. Blessed in fruitfulness of all the living beings that are in your control, people, animal, plants, 
doesn't matter. They will be fruitful. Blessed are you in military action. Your enemies will fall before you. All you do will be blessed and you will be elevated in honor and established as holy. Simply guard the commands of Hashem and walk in his ways. And you will have an abundance of the good things that this world has to offer. Families, food, wealth. You will not lack nor suffer famine. You will rise over all the nations of the earth and be placed at the top of the stack. You will be given the place of the greatest honor in the earth. And then in verse 15, the text takes a dark shift. If you do not hearken to these words, then these are the curses that will overtake you. And in verse 16 through 19, the blessings of the previous section are all overturned and made into curses. And in verse 20, the curses begin to be defined even more. It begins with a plague, wasting disease and inflammation and fevers and violence and corruption. Verse 23, then famine and drought. Verse 25, not just defeat before your enemies, you will be routed completely and embarrassingly. In verse 27, then come the plagues of Egypt, the boils and the scabs and the itch which cannot be healed. Then verse 28, madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. You will be oppressed and plundered with no one to deliver. And then from verse 30 to 33, things begin to get personal. Personal tragedies will follow and will be part of this. The things that were protected in Deuteronomy 20, well, they will no longer be protected. The engaged man will not get to marry. The home builder will not get to occupy. The vineyard planter will not get to partake. Your enemies will eat the ox that you prepared and your pack animals and flocks will be stolen. Your sons and daughters will be taken from you and a foreign nation will take all that you have created in your labor. And then halfway through verse 33, the chiasm of this chapter begins to back out in reverse order. You will be oppressed. You will be mad and blind. You will have boils that cannot be healed. You will be defeated in military action. You will experience famine and lack of food. You will be destroyed as a people. And then from verse 49 through 56 continues the downward spiral. This section describes a desperation that leads people to become violent and suspicious of one another, embracing their beastly nature as they engage in the greatest of tragedies. Fathers turning against their children and wives, hoarding for himself the flesh of his own offspring, lest they take it from him and he go hungry. And it's not just brutish men who will act in this way. The most delicate of women you will discover to not be so delicate after all. She will eat her own children to survive and grow suspicious of all who are around her, even her own family members, thinking that they might steal this food from her. This food being no real food at all, but rather her own flesh and blood. The food of ultimate desperation. Humans thrust into the role of beasts, snarling and fighting over scraps of their children. The lowest that a human can possibly go. And then in verse 58, exile is described. The diseases of Egypt are poured out. The great population of Israel is destroyed. They're scattered among the nations and they serve other gods. Depression and grief and powerlessness to change anything around them. Fear of the day because of the terrors that it holds and fear of the night because of the terror that it holds. No rest, no shalom, no Sabbath, no relaxation. Only fear and suspicion and violence and death all around. All of this ending and being sold as slaves being offered on the market, but you will be so pathetic that no one will buy you. What this describes is the place of ultimate shame, the lowest that a person can go before death. No honor, no friends, no peace, no comfort, only pain, only shame, your only hope being found in death. Now, we often look at these as contrasts of blessing and curse, but as we have discovered, there is in these a contrast of honor and shame as well. The culmination of blessing, you will be at the top and all others will be under you. The culmination of curse, 
You will be at the bottom of all others, and no one will be there to even give you purpose. This chapter, it can be hard to read because it reveals just how far any one of us could go in the face of overwhelming adversity. The popular psychologist Jordan Peterson says that we each have it within us to be a Nazi, given the right set of circumstances. And he is right. Without God, we are hopeless. And Deuteronomy 28 speaks to this. We each have it within us to eat our own children while treating others that we love with suspicion and even violence to keep this little bit for ourselves when faced with the right circumstances. It is within us, that darkness. We are truly detestable creatures when we are left to our own devices. And so into this depravity of the human experience, Hashem introduced his instructions. The Torah, given as a guidebook to begin to change humanity from the trajectory of the beast to the place where we can begin to act in the image of God. In these instructions, they created a people who began to become more than they had ever been, a people who operated on the principle of love, or in the beginning, simply obedience rather than selfishness, a people who sought to become more like their God and King because he provided an image that we could step into and become. Rather than being in the image of the beast, humanity was given the opportunity through the Torah to become more like God. And yet, because we are children, there does need to be punishment as a motivator to seek to be more. We have to be brought low before we will recognize our need for God, our need for salvation. Because without it, we're just another animal. And so when we take the stance that the curses of the Torah have passed away and have been superseded by only blessing. We take away the power of God to reach many who might otherwise be rescued. We give the excuse to those who are suffering that you are okay. What is happening right now is no fault of your own, and it's not judgment from God. It's science. It's chance. It's just happenstance. God had nothing to do with you being brought low. No need to examine yourself. No need to dig deep inside and discover how you might have contributed. No need for repentance in face of adversity. It's just life, that's all, nothing more. And so when these events come upon us, when the world goes haywire and wonky, what do we find? Well, when COVID hit the world, there was no end of Christian, even Messianic, apologists out there claiming that this was not a judgment that God was not involved, that this sort of thing just happens. And yet scripture tells us this, Isaiah 45, 5-7, I am Hashem and there is no one else. There is no God besides me. I gird you though you have not known me, so that they know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none but me. I am Hashem and there is none else, forming light and creating darkness, making peace and creating evil. I, Hashem, do all these things. And so the question comes, does Hashem do evil things? And for many of this, this sounds like heresy. It is a fact in our mind that God can do no evil. So let me ask you a question. Are curses evil? Well, for the person on the receiving end of a curse, yes, they are. For the mother eating her child because of starvation that is occurring because of the enemy that is encamped outside the city, it is evil. And we read here that this evil situation is brought about by Hashem. Chapter 28, verse 20, Hashem brings the curse. Verse 21, Hashem makes the plague cling to you. 22, Hashem strikes you with wasting disease. Verse 24, Hashem makes the rain to cease. Verse 25, Hashem causes you to be defeated. Verse 27, Hashem strikes you with the boils of Egypt. Verse 28, Hashem strikes you with madness and blindness. 35, Hashem strikes you with boils again. Verse 36, Hashem brings you into exile in another nation. Verse 37, Hashem drives you into another nation. And it goes on. The source of these evil experiences that cause us to be uncomfortable in the pit of our stomachs is Hashem. 
because we misunderstand evil and good, in my opinion. We assign moral value to these words and we make them out to be absolutes that we should all strive for on one side and shun on the other. But that is incorrect. These things, good and evil, they are just tools that can be used to accomplish greater purposes. Remember, Hashem knows and is intimately acquainted with both good and evil. Both are tools in His hands to bring about the change that He desires in the world. And so to say that the curses of Deuteronomy have ceased is to take a tool out of the hand of God. No more discipline for the sake of correction, only the carrot, only the good. Simply entice people with good outcomes and they will respond and make logical decisions. But people aren't logical. We react emotionally more often than we think and act and our reactions are based solely on instinct and emotion. And these curses, they create situations of instinct and emotion. They are tools used by God in the world. Even today, God brings about situations in people's lives in order to bring them low and to drive them to repentance. And these curses will one day be poured out over all the earth for the same purpose to cause people to recognize their own helplessness and depravity in order to cause them to turn to Hashem for salvation. Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Here in Deuteronomy, these curses were given to Israel, and they were applied to only Israel. No one else was held liable to the terms of the covenant that Hashem cut with Israel. But at the death of Yeshua, the gospel of the kingdoms went to all nations. A truth that has been held as the precious possession of a single nation became the property of the entire world. And this covenant is open to all peoples. And you don't have to look Jewish or Hebrew. This covenant is open to all peoples. And part of our side of the patron-client relationship then requires us to tell others about this covenant, to publish this gospel to the world. And this kingdom, it's not a kingdom of good versus kingdoms of evil. Every kingdom is able to use both for their cause. This kingdom is instead a kingdom of life that is opposed to the kingdoms of death of this world. And so all the world is to be given the opportunity to at least hear of the gospel, to know the terms of this agreement, and accept or reject the terms before the blessings or curses can be employed. We must always remember the occurrence of these curses is for one goal and one goal only, repentance, to cause pain and sorrow in the lives of all who are living through times of cursing in order to wake them up to wake us up and to drive us to repentance. Even those of us who think we are okay, especially those of us who think we are okay, because that is the trap. The moment that we think we are okay is the moment we let our guard down. And so when we read of the curses of Deuteronomy coming down on the earth in the book of Revelation, we discover that these curses did not pass away with Yeshua. And what is it that makes me say that these curses are the same from Deuteronomy? Well, in chapter 28, 22 through 23, we read of a fiery heat in the heavens being turned to bronze. Revelation 16, 8 to 9, And the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was given to him to burn men with fire. And men were burned with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who possesses authority over these plagues. And they did not repent to give him honor. Throughout this chapter of Deuteronomy, we read of the destruction of crops and herds in verses 22, 24, 30, 38 through 40, and 42. And in Revelation 6, 5 through 6, it says, And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. And I looked and I saw a black horse, and he who sat on it was holding a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A measure of wheat for a denarius, and three measures of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. Or Revelation 8, 7, And the first angel sounded, and there came to be hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. In this chapter we read of many migrations and conquests and wars. 
Revelation 6, 2 through 4. And I looked and I saw a white horse and he who sat on it holding a bow. And a crown was given to him and he went out overcoming and to overcome. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was given to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that they should slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. Or Revelation thirteen seven, And it was given to him, the beast, to fight with the holy ones and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. Again, in this chapter, we read of plagues and disease and mass human casualties. Revelation 6, 8. And I looked and I saw a green horse, and he who sat on it had the name of death. And Sheol followed with him, and authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with disease and with the beasts of the earth. Revelation thirteen fifteen, And there was given to him to give spirit to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause to be killed as many as would not worship the image of the beast. Revelation sixteen two, And the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and an evil and wicked sore came upon the men those having the mark of the beast and those worshipping his image. We read of the plagues of Egypt, boils that cannot be healed. Revelation 9, 3-6 through six, And out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and authority was given to them as the scorpions of the earth possess authority. And it was given to them that they should not kill them, but to torture them for five months. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it. And they shall long to die, but death shall flee from them. Locusts, an unescapable sickness. The sea will be turned to blood, Revelation 16.3. Darkness will cover the earth, Revelation 6.12. We've already read of the pestilence in Revelation 6.8. Great hail will fall on the earth, Revelation 16.21. And throughout the book we read of those who overcome and those who are persecuted by the beast. Revelation 12:17 and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to fight with the remnant of her seed those guarding the commands of God and possessing the witness of Yeshua the Messiah we discover here that it is those who guard the commands of God alongside the witness of Yeshua as the Messiah that enrages the dragon to the point of persecuting the saints and in Revelation 14, we read of the things that help the Holy Ones to endure this time of trial and judgment. Revelation 14, 12, here is the endurance of the Holy Ones. Here are those guarding the commands of God and the belief, the faith, the allegiance of Yeshua. In the days of this persecution, it will be a combination of guarding the commands of God alongside the testimony and allegiance to Yeshua that will both enrage the dragon and provide for the endurance of the faith. But this is not the only place in Revelation that we encounter this idea that the commands are no more. In chapter 2 of Revelation, we read of a sect called the Nicolaitans twice, a group that has been shrouded in mystery for quite some time, And there have arisen a few takes on just who this mysterious group is that was disparaged by Yeshua. First, let's look on what Revelation has to say about them. Revelation 2.6, Yet this you have, that you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And Revelation 2.14-15, But I hold a few matters against you, because you have there those who adhere to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat food offering to idols, and to commit whoring. So you also have those who adhere to the teaching of Nicolaitans, which teaching I hate. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, it's because this sect is pertinent to the topic at hand. So I've heard various interpretations of who the Nicolaitans are and just what it is that they believe that was so hated by Yeshua. The first argument is accomplished by breaking down the Greek word to its component words. Nico, conquer, and laity, the people. Thus, it is thought the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is one that exalts church leadership and places men over other men in church structure. The second is a take that uses the word Nicolaitans and assumes that this is a word that was made up and it's based on a mixture of Hebrew and Greek. Nico, after all, sounds a lot like the Hebrew word for nechal, which means to eat, and laity, of course, means the people. 
And this take then makes the doctrine of the Nicolaitans to be the doctrine that teaches that all things may be eaten by the people. It's simply a repeat of the doctrine of Balaam. Both of these are unfortunately incorrect. How do I know? Well, because we have documentation by an early church founder that was dealing with the Nicolaitans, and he tells us what they believe. Arrhenius, the bishop of Lugdunum in Gaul, who lived from 125 to 202 CE, had this to say about the Nicolaitans in his series of books named Against Heresies, of which there are several volumes. In volume one, Arrhenius identifies Nicholas as one of the seven Greeks who was chosen in Acts chapter six, who then gained a personal following. In this volume, Arrhenius states that they were men who led lives of unrestrained indulgence. In volume three of the same work, Arrhenius goes into further depth by connecting this sect with Gnosticism. Quote, John, the disciple of the Lord, preaches this faith. Uh, being the deity of Christ in context, and seeks by the proclamation of the gospel to remove the air by which Serinthius had been disseminating among men, and a long time previously by those termed Nicolaitans, who are an offset of that knowledge, knowledge being in quotes, falsely so called, that he, John, might confound them and persuade them that there is but one God who made all things by his word. So we read here that John confronted this heretical sect according to Irenaeus, and he preached against them. And what do we know? They make an appearance here in the book of Revelation as teaching things that Yeshua hates. This appears to be a group of Gnostics who believed that the law was done away with, and so they lived lives of unrestrained indulgence. They taught the doctrine that the gospel of Christ made the law of no effect, and that by believing Christians are released from the necessity of being doers of the word of God. When Yeshua speaks against the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in Revelation, it is this very idea that's being attacked. The Torah is not obsolete or done away with. And we discover throughout the entire book of Revelation that these ideas of the Torah being obsolete, they're put to rest. The doctrine of the cessation of the Torah, Yeshua clearly states he hates once we know who the Nicolaitans are. Those who endure and who are persecuted are identified as those who guard the commands of God and keep the testimony of Yeshua. And throughout we read of the curses of Deuteronomy and Leviticus being poured out on the world at large, but the saints are taken into the wilderness and they are protected from the plagues, and yet they are given their own set of tests something that we looked at back in Numbers and that we read of in the book of Ezekiel. Judgments on the world for the rejection of the Torah and the king who gave it is poured out. As punishment, yes. But punishment is given for the purpose of repentance, not simply to harm or destroy or to cause pain. And then we get to the end of the book of Revelation. And when we get there, we discover that the blessings that are spoken of here in Deuteronomy 28, these blessings that have been experienced by very few people in the course of history, these blessings, they become pervasive and they fill the entire earth. Death and disease disappear forever. Bounty and abundance are experienced by all. And the world becomes defined by life and no longer by death. The hope of new creation the blessings promised to those who remain true to the covenant in Deuteronomy. You see, these blessings and curses, they do not stand alone. They are not just for Israel or just for the Jews. These blessings in this age apply to all who would pledge allegiance to the king and his kingdom, and who would then live out the types of life described in his treaty and demonstrated by his king. And then it extends to all the earth. But this this life lived in allegiance to the king and his kingdom starts with love. Revelation 2, 1 through 4. To the angel of the assembly of Ephesus write, He who is holding the seven stars in his right hand, who is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your works and your labor and your endurance, and that you are not able to bear evil ones, and have tried those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them false. 
and you have been bearing up and have endurance and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. But I hold this against you, that you have left your first love. Now for millennia, translators have rendered verse 4 as you have forgotten your first love. But the Greek in this place, it's a bit vague because this verse can also read, you have left love first. You do all the right things and you are enduring and you have great works, but you have forgotten to lead with love. Your guiding motivation has gone away. And this is the key to it all. Without love, all the command guarding and testimony bearing in the world is pointless because we give others a false idea of who God is as we bear his image. But love comes first. Love will be last. Love will endure because like God, love is eternal. So don't obey in order to gain the blessings. And don't obey in order to avoid judgment. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but it is not the end. These motivations, they might get you on the path, but they are the motivations of the immature. For the mature, the motivation is and always will be love. So don't forget, even when the world descends into chaos, corruption, and destruction, love comes first. Blessings and curses, well, they are simply tools. Tools that God has given us to help us to accomplish our call of spreading the gospel. Tools that God uses to guide us back to him. Tools that can bring life in the midst of death. So Deresh Chai, seek life in all that you do. Shalom. Thank you for tuning in to Deresh Chai. If this content has blessed you and you would like more, please consider subscribing, liking, commenting, and sharing with others. To find out more about what we do and to support this ministry, head over to SeekLifeSC.com. That's SeekLifeSC.com. We'll see you again next time as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Shalom.